Very good afternoon to everybody. Once again, welcome to our final session for UB Research Essential Series 2. Uh, this is in fact our 10th uh, session for the semester. It began with the faculty seminar, two sessions in faculty seminar, and then followed through with eight more sessions uh, over the past uh, four months. So I do hope you have benefited from this session. As I've said, all the sessions have been recorded. We are currently trying to compile all the recorded sessions and, and put it in central uh, through the UB website and also the, the UB LibGuide. So we will provide you the links very soon since uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the record of all the participants that have actually uh, attended the session. So to conclude our session today, our last session for the fall 2020 semester, uh, we have another interesting session which will be facilitated by Ms. Virginia Balance today. Uh, so today's session is very much to focus on research metrics. How do you make sense of research metrics? So research metric is important, okay? For those of you who had the chance to attend uh, my session last week, where we focus on uh, research impact and research visibility. So it is also related when you talk about uh, research metrics, you're basically talking about measures used uh, to quantify or to, to, uh, to calculate the impact and prestige of a scholarly publication. So it is important because you spend many years or months in carrying out your research. And at the end of the day, you want to ensure that the research is published in a reputable publication where it is recognized, especially when you talk about your promotion. In some university, they do spell out what are the publications that you can publish. Uh, sometimes it is also important for certain bodies. When you're applying for certain funding grants, they may look at the quality of the publication that comes out as well. So it is quite important for you to understand what are these metrics and how do you make sense of these metrics. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Ms. Balance to actually share your screen now. Okay, thank you. Um... This is the screen I'm going to share. Can you see it? Is is are are we seeing my my screen? Um yes. It's a I just have to now make it go the slideshow, right? Yes. Um slideshow start from the beginning. Here we are. So they're making sense of research metrics or how to measure scholarly impact. As uh, Dr. Vic was saying, um, when you write a paper, uh, it's important that the paper is put in a highly visible and impactful journal. And you need to know which uh, journals in your discipline meet that criteria. So the question is, how do you know if a particular uh, journal has a high impact? How is this measured? And uh, what is the rank of the journal that you're submitting to? So this is the field of what they call bibliometrics, which studies research metrics, studies the references or cit citations um, that um, publish your paper um, and um, it lets the, uh, the metrics are quant quant quantifying and analyzing and calculates from the data, the impact or prestige of that journal within the discipline and by extension, the researcher's academic value. So today's presentation I hope will help make sense of uh, research metrics, what they are, why they are important, and I'll give an overview as best I can of the most common measurements of a journal's impact and how they're calculated. So I'll look at the JIF or IF, journal impact factor, the Eigen factor, article influence score, uh, the site score, the SNP, the CIMAGO journal rank, SJR, and our dear friend, Google Scholar. 
and uh, mention also the author H index, alternative metrics, which track and analyze scholarship through social media and non-academic sources. And finally, how to use metrics to your advantage and responsibly. Um, as Dr. Vic mentioned in his introduction, research metrics are used by academics for a variety of reasons to determine what are the best journals in their field, uh, to decide where to publish, where to sub submit an article for publication. Um, and then based on who publishes in the most highly ranked journals, it might give you ideas of other researchers to collaborate with. Um, where your journal, where your research is published may very well influence um, grant funding decisions. And um, back home at the university, the journals where you are publishing and how they're ranked may well influence promotion and tenure and even hiring decisions. Um, and also in the library, uh, when we are considering adding new titles to our collection of journals, we might look at the journal impact to see whether it's worth adding to the collection. Um, research metrics got started in the bad old days pre-automation. Um, and as I say, librarians use them as a method to determine which journals to subscribe to. Um, but the creators of the current abstract and indexing services used it, created uh, journal impact factors to determine which journals to include for indexing. So to introduce this whole, ask, this whole idea of citation analysis, I thought it would be much easier to look at the simplest measure, which is usage data. Now in these days of digital or electronic journals, it's fairly easy to find out how many times an article has been downloaded or it's abstract viewed or in the aggregate data for an entire journal title, um, abstracts and views by journal title as opposed to article. Um, normally this data is collected by the publisher, the journal supplier, such as EBSCO, um, and a library would go into the admin part of their um, setup to look at what the data is, to find out which is the highest used journal, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, or you could go to the publisher's website to find out um, of the basket of journals they publish, what are the highest used. So uh, librarians and publish have, publishers have even developed a standard called counter, C-O-U-N-T-E-R, so that, uh, that how we tabulate or keep track of um, usage of electronic resources is done consistently, credibly, and comparably. So when you look at counter data for a typical journal in your collection, you can compare it across other journals in your collection. And you, you know that this, the way the, the data is tabulated is consistent. So you're comparing apples and apples rather than apples and oranges. But if you've got to publish in, okay, and another point with this is it's only for online usage, it doesn't ca capture print journal usage in a library. So that's something that, that doesn't get caught up in your data. But these days, publish or perish, you've got to publish in a high impact journal. The best known metric is the journal impact factor. It's better known these days as the IF or the JIF. Um, this is a, as a brief bit of background, it was created in the early 60s by Eugene Garfield and Irving Schur to select journals for the Science Citation Index. Um, so to compare journals to be included in the index. Um, the, out of um, the Science Citation Index, the Social Science Citation Index, and more recently, the Arts and Humanities Citation Index. They're now part of a whole 
uh, aggregate called the Web of Science Core Collection Database. Um, and that's what the journal uh, citation reports, the JCR uses to look at the citations used in individual articles. Um, so it's a well-known metric used for assessing a journal's performance. And also it's a common proxy for journal quality. Um, today, the uh, JCR is published by a Clarivet uh, uh, Analytics, which is an information company. Now, how is the JCR, uh, the, the uh, JIF uh, calculated? It's the number of citations received in one year to content published in the journal during the previous two years, divided by the total number of articles or reviews published in the journal in the previous two years. So it's a two year glimpse backwards um, to uh, find out how many citations are uh, referred to in the next year. So here's a, an example. So citations in 20, 2017, so tw tw 2015 and 16, divided by the total number of citable items in 2015 and 16. And that makes your JIF. Um, some of the disadvantages of this JIF is that it only uses data from journals indexed in Web of Science databases. Um, you have to have a subscription in order to look at the JCR, which many libraries don't because it's very expensive. Um, there is a bias towards English language and North America, Western Europe and Australian publications. And um, it takes time for new journals to get a track record. Um, so they're often not included for, for the first little while. Um, even uh, Mr. Garfield acknowledged that this two-year period uh, would preclude uh, highly cited articles from being picked up that have a longer uh, citation life. Um, they use an arithmetic mean, so there's no distribution um, for citations. Um, if an article in the set gets highly cited, it can skew the results and not in a journal, not all articles get citations. Um, they make the JIF makes no decision, distinction between types of articles, uh, whether it's an editorial, a review article or an original article, they're all counted the same. Um, it only looks at the number of citations it not the quality. So if you are uh, bashing a bad article it gets cited in your in your article, and then that one, that article citation gets picked up, but it doesn't say that it's a bad article. It just is a number. So they're all the same. Um, you cannot uh, compare the impact factors across disciplines because citation patterns are different and vary in each discipline. For example, an article published in mathematics tends to have very few references, whereas in social sciences, they may have 50 or 60 references. So that the sheer number can uh, change the uh, impact factor. Um, and because the JIF is on a two-year window, um, it's only calculated on two years of data, the values can vary from year to year for, due to random causes um, so that smaller journals um, would have a, a, a bigger problem to get any kind of impact factor. You know, maybe a journal didn't publish in a year or um, didn't have as many articles, so it doesn't have as big a numerator or denominator to uh, calculate from. So uh, that bearing the two-year problem in mind, uh, a variation was suggested by 
Eugene Garfield to use a five-year impact factor rather than two years because two years is great for fast-moving science where articles get picked up and research is done on similar topics and so articles get get cited again and again but um, for discipline where research, research has a, a more longevity or for smaller journals which may only publish once a year um, they need a bigger number of articles to include in the calculation. So the five-year impact factor um, was suggested. But because of um, some of the inherent issues with the, with the impact factor, um, in 20, 2007, um, using network theory, um, the eigenfactor was introduced to measure the influence and prestige um, of a journal. And it's based on whether the journal is cited in other reputable journals, not any journal, just reputable journals within the past five years. Um, adjustments are made for subject areas so that the reference list is weighted because different fields have different citation practices. It excludes self citations. So if you've written an article and you draw on a previous article of your own, and cite yourself, that doesn't count. So self-citations is sort of, it's re viewed as gaming the system, if you like, that giving yourself citations to increase your uh, impact factor of you. Um, and also journals do it too, uh, where we, you want to uh, see, you'll publish as an editor will say, I'll publish this if you quote from um, articles that we have published in our own basket of journals. So those would be excluded from uh, the calculation of the eigenfactor. Um, another problem with eigenfactor is that uh, journals are assigned to one category. So there's no way to do cross-discipline comparison. Um, and then all journals calculated are all the scores equal 100. So it's going to be a very, very small number, your eigenfactor. Um, it can, as I say, eigenfactor can be at the journal level or the author level. Um, and eigenfactor is available free on, the, uh, on their website. Um, using a journal's eigenfactor, a further calculation is the article influence score, which um, measures the average influence of a journal's articles in the first five years after publication. So the mean would be 1.0. So if a journal, uh, journal's AIS is greater than one, that means the journal has an above average level of influence. And it only is for article, uh, journals which have been in publication for five years years or more. So the, the eigenfactor and the AIS uh, is available free on their eigenfactor website. I uh, pulled up an example, the current opinion in plant biology to show its EF, eigenfactor and AI. Um, and you can go in there and you can um, look at the various projects they have using this data and uh, search for journals to find out where they stand in the journal ranking. So those are three uh, products coming out of Clarivet Analytics using the Web of Science databases. There's competition. Uh, the competition is from Elsevier, which um, has produced uh, the database called Scopus. Um, and from the metadata in Scopus, they've created a, an impact factor, a, a couple impact factor um, products. One is called Site Score. Um, um, Elsevier launched this journal evaluation metric in 2016. Um, they only created Scopus in 2004, and then have backfilled their, their indexes to about 1996. Um, so this is a relatively new um, metric. 
Um, unlike the JIF, it's based on four years. Um, and um, it originally started using three years, but then they changed the methodology and wiped out all that data on three year uh, impact factors. So it's now four years. Um, it I also um, use limits the types of content that it analyzes to articles, literature reviews, conference papers, book chapters, and data sources. So it does not include editorials and letters to the editor, which in science may actually have quite an impact on um, the, the uh, field, on the discipline, where a discussion on a topic might come in, in letters to the editor or the editorials. Um, So you can actually go into the Scopus preview page and look at um, the site score for a journal. And again, I've put down here the current opinion in plant biology. So it shows its site score, uh, how many citations and documents and percent cited. So it's, and you can, uh, you can use the the drop downs to change the metrics for different years. And you can also search in this um, by author or source. So it's, uh, and it's free. So that's, that's quite useful. Um, they also uh, offer what's called the SNP, the source normalized impact per paper. And this was, um, um, created in 2012, and it contextualizes citations. So it measures the impact of a paper within a subject field by weighting the different citations in the articles. So it, it tries to correct discipline specific differences in citation practices. Um, so it's, it's, it tries, but I'm not sure how well it does it. It um, helps authors decide which uh, journals are performing best in their subject field. Um, and um, it's calculated annually and it's freely available. Again, on the, the Elsevier webpage. Um, another journal ranking uh, product from Elsevier is the SJR, the Simajo Journal and Country Rank um, database. Um, it also extracts data from the metadata about articles from the Scopus database and has data going back to 1996. Um, it's basically a journal prestige ranking um, based on the idea that not all citations are the same. So it tries to use qualitative as well as quantitative measures for, for to find a journal's impact. And it does this by assigning a weight to the citing journal of each reference. So a citation from a journal with a high SJR value is worth more than a citation from a low, a journal with a, a, a low SJR score. Um, the neat thing about the SJR database, it also provides a country ranking on research output. And uh, the Bahamas is included. So there's the, uh, it takes weighted citations for a given year divided by the number of articles in the previous three years. And this is the, an example of an Elsevier journal, the current opinion in plant biology. And on the side, on the left-hand side of the screen, normally there's a blue, blue uh, boxes which you click on. And the bottom one is the uh, journal metrics. And I've just cut and pasted them up here. So uh, Elsevier will put the site score first, obviously. Then it goes and borrows the impact factor from the web of science and the five-year impact factor for web of science and then the source normalized impact per paper, the SNP um, 
four papers and the SIMAGO journal rank, the SJR. So it tries to put as many um, metrics on the, the, on the web page so that you can have a look, but it helps to, to uh, you have to check these out. Um, this is the SIMAGO uh, journal and country rank. I, what I like about this is it, it, you have to, the, all the journals in the world, the top ranking one is uh, the, a cancer journal, CA. Um, but you can actually limit um, by discipline and subdiscipline, by region and type of, of um, article or book chapter, and then also by the year. And I found that the current opinion in plant biology in um, 2019 was ranked for in this field. It also, you'll see also that the SJR includes open access journals and you see how highly they're ranked. So there is truly a lot of work to be done on uh, um, in convincing academics to publish in open access journals when they say, oh, they're not highly ranked. Yes, in some fields, they are indeed highly ranked. Um, believe it or not, Google Scholar also ranks um, journals. Um, it's hidden on the, the Google Scholar page. You go and look at these little three lines and click on that and opens up a menu and one of it's called metrics. And it um, produces a list of the top 100 journals. But then you can further refine it by asking for different categories and um, then subcategories. So the category business economics and management. And in this case, I asked for the subcategory of hospitality. And um, it provides what they call the H5 index and the H5 median. So the H5 index, um, is the largest number H of articles published in the last five years that have at least H number citations. So if you have 18 articles published in the last five years with 18 citations each, your H index is 18. Your H5 index would be 18. And um, that is at journal level and author level. So it's a, a research metric that um, is fairly recent, 2015, 2005, I should say. So only 15 years um, that helps measure the productivity of a research or the, and the cite, citation impact of their um, publications. So as I say, you have 10 papers cited 10 times or more, you'll have an H index of 10. Um, I pulled up one of our professors' uh, Google Scholar profile to demonstrate um, what it looks like, uh, what the H and HI10 indexes look like on his page. Um, out of all his papers, he has 400 and 83 citations to his papers. So they're cited by other read other papers. And his last his nine of his papers have nine citations. So that mean means that uh, in the last uh, five years. So that's nine. And over 10 years, it's eight. I looked mine up and mine is four. <laughs> were my whole career. Um, so that H index is really a simple way to gauge your productivity. Um, there's also, uh, these are unique to Google Scholar. There's also a thing called the G index, which is supposed to be an improvement over the H index. 
and it accounts for the performance of the of an author's um, top articles. And so it uses a, a line G squared to find what your index is. So all these traditional metrics um, seem to show there's no perfect way to measure the quality of impact of a, an article or a journal, they all measure, all they measure are the citations showing which journal is publishing the articles. But beyond citations in academic journals, there's a whole world to measure the impact of your research in the social media and other online sources. So traditional metrics just don't measure outside of academia. So the alt metrics or alternative metrics have emerged in the past, I think, five years. So each type of media is weighted. So a mention of your research in an international newspaper, let's say in The Guardian or, um, or on the, the New York Times, it would have a higher rating than, let's say, a tweet. Um, in the example on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see there's a score in the middle which is rep and it's circled by a colorful donut. And each color in the donut represents a different source of the data. So in this case, there's lots of red and dark red. So those would be things like news. And then uh, mentioned in Google, mentioned in Facebook, Twitter, blogs, and Mendeley uh, database. Um, so, to look at a real example, we go back to uh, Dr. DeLuca's article in the current opinion in plant biology. And on the article page, you can click a button um, called show me the altmetric score and down pops a, a picture of the donut and the, uh, the colorful donut with a number in the middle, which shows us that his article was picked up by three news outlets, blogged by two people, tweeted a lot, probably amongst his colleagues. It's appeared on some Facebook pages and referenced in Wikipedia. And if you um, click on more details, um, it breaks it down even further. So you, it tells you a summary. And I thought that was so cute. It's uh, this compared, this paper has done particularly well and is in the 97th percentile. It's in the top 5% of all research ever outputs ever tracked by Altmetric. So that's really a, a coup. That's very good. Um, a few things about Altmetrics. In order to get an Altmetric score, the article must have a DOI, a digital object identifier, so that um, it can track it properly. And if you want to look at altmetric scores on articles, random articles that you find, let's say in Google or on other databases, um, you have to download a bookmarklet. It's free and doesn't hurt your computer. So that when you have the article on your page, you can just uh, open on your computer, you can just uh, look at the, click on the bookmarklet and it, this, this will pop down. So you can see um, outside of, of its normal um, impact scores, the, um, this article has had a lot of attention in social media. So he hasn't done too badly. So in sum, uh, when you look at uh, research metrics, you have to consider a lot of things. First of all, the data, where is the data uh, coming from? It's coming from specific databases or like Google Scholar from everything. Um, some of these products uh, correct field differences some don't. Google Scholar just takes everything. Uh, the period under review can be different depending on the uh, product, uh, four years, two years, five years, forever. 
Um, sometimes they use all uh, information sources that you've, you've quoted in your article, sometimes not, and all document types. And um, in the case of Google Scholar, they even include duplicate entries of articles. You'll see uh, if when you search for an article in Google Scholar, you'll see it's the original article in the published in the journal. You'll see a preprint on ResearchGate. You'll see uh, maybe a citation from another um, article from another book or something. So it can be there can be duplicate article entries in Google Scholar for the same thing. So we have to uh, look at these quantitative um, measures, you know, bearing in mind their limitations. Um, and we need to look at a range of metrics, not just one, um, and also look at some qualitative measures to get a whole picture because sometimes uh, papers are very relevant but only read by government people or have an impact on the public rather than in academia. Um, also be aware that some people will game the system to try to get a good score. So they'll um, self-cite or inflate the number of citations in their article from a particular journal, a highly impact, uh, high rated journal, just to get a higher score for themselves and ultimately the journal they're publishing in. So those are just some of the problems that uh, come up with um, research metrics. Um, there is a thing called the metrics toolkit, which was put together by librarians to help scholars and evaluators understand and use citation metrics responsibly and judiciously. Um, each metric is explained in detail and it explains how to use them in grant applications on your CV in um, promotion and tenure applications. And it's interesting to see on this uh, infographic, which you use inside uh, the metrics toolkit, Amazon, imagine Amazon um, ranking of a book is a research metric. I found that so surprising. I thought, yes, of course it is. Um, so in some, um, uh, research metrics have been part of the academic landscape for a long time, over 40 years, 50 years. Um, some are difficult to understand um, and have a strange calculation. And it's not, you know, not consistent how they're used. So this metric toolkit will help a lot um, with that. So on that, uh, there, but there ends my uh, presentation on research metrics. Um, I did want to, uh, at this point, just give an update on the Mendeley um, reference management um, product. Um, they're going to be uh, scaling back um, and focusing more on the reference manager, like the bib bibliographic manager part of the product, um, research data management and citation solutions. So they'll retiring certain um, parts of their product, the profiles where they used to encourage you to go to look for collaborators. I think that's gonna be merged more into Scopus um, author profiles. Um, the feed, which is from their own database of um, all the citations in the Mendeley product. So there'll be no more suggestions coming to your inbox. Um, there are um, canceling out public groups, but private groups will continue. And then their funding database, which is a big blow um, because I think it was it was another place for uh, researchers to to look for possible funding opportunities. So that's an update on Mendeley.
Okay, are there any questions? Thank you so much, Ms. Balance, uh, for giving us the details on what this research metrics all about. It can be, be a bit complicated for, for some of us uh, who, who is new, especially when you talk about identifying journals and what does all this number basically means. Um, okay, is there any question? I don't see any question from the chat. Anybody want to ask a question? Please feel free to raise your hand and you can speak or you can even put in your chat. Miss Balance, I have a question on a, on this matrix. Is there is there a matrix to track book publication and book chapters? Yes, yeah, some of these metrics do uh, track book uh, chapters. Um, but again, they have to be... Um, included in um, in those databases, like indexed in the database. And, and some databases do index uh, books. I believe there is a specific book. Um, a, a specific uh, product which looks at books. OK. Uh, but I don't know it right off the top of my head. So I suppose only books that are published by some international publishers, which carries an ISBN. I think only those kind of books will be tracked. Yes. Uh, compared um, to uh, some, because you, you, we do a lot of publication, self-published uh, books, uh, which may not be recognized. Yeah, they would not be picked up. Um, you may notice now um, that some book publishers uh, uh, supply a DOI, a digital object identifier to chapters of books. Yes. And as long as there is a DOI, then the alt metric can be um, captured. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, I should have prepared for that. I did see something briefly about books and book chapters okay um a place to look for those but um like i say some of the these products do include book book chapters so um and then there's a, another thing is uh because you see if you look at ub we do have the uh the faculty of fine arts and they do a lot of work in terms of producing uh, music CDs and all those things and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and how do we uh, in, in a scholarly environment how what kind of metrics that can be used to to measure this uh, uh, because uh, it is because uh, it is in a, in a in a scholarly environment that is considered as a, as a, as a as a contribution to the knowledge it is a it is something that is can be regarded as similar to a journal publication or a book publication. So you have mm. someone producing, composing, and then coming up with the CD. So how, what sort of metrics can, is, I'm not sure because uh, I know uh, Dr. Gengelhoff is here in the-, in the she's, she's also saying, yeah, this is exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, as far as I know, I, well, I, I don't know, I should say. I really don't know, but it, I will look in the metrics toolkit and it may give some um, guidance on that. But the yeah. fact that the Amazon logo came up, um, sales would be a proxy of okay. something. Mm. Um, but there, yeah. there, there surely is a way of tracking um, the impact of a, of a CD, you know, this is a, a classic yeah. recording. This is a you know unique, and and maybe in in those cases, um, you have to also look at the qualitative, like the reviews of the CD, to look at their impact, as opposed to only the quantitative uh, uh, sales numbers or whatever. So I don't know whether sales is, is a good way of actually measuring uh, uh, impact. Uh, I see something that uh, Dr. Gengal have put on the chat. 
what Be kind of better. metrics can you use for creative work? But if you use sales, then you get accused of producing commercial work. Well, and then you get, you know, gold records, uh, yeah. Grammy Award records. That's a yeah. metric. Yeah. Would it not be? Or, or, um, yeah. It's a bit more tricky, actually. So, yeah, uh, a little more tricky. But I, yeah. I, I suspect in the metrics toolkit that, that is addressed. Yeah. Yeah. But then, but this is something that uh, we have to look at as well because uh, I have been. Uh, asked many, many times, uh, especially uh, uh, in in promotion boards, and how do you actually uh, differentiate, or how do you actually uh, uh, calculate the value of someone doing creative work compared to someone who have actually published? So, yeah. is it the same or is it different? So, uh, so, so there must be a metrics uh, out there. I'm trying to find as well. I don't see such a metric that have uh, tried to benchmark a creative work versus a, a typical uh, general publication or book publication. So how do we put this together? So it's, it's a bit more difficult. That's my so, homework. <laughs> yeah, I think there may be, I don't know. So, uh, so we need to maybe contact some of these uh, top uh, universities that runs this program, the like Berkeley and all, and, and see how do they actually uh, manage uh, uh, in terms of uh, evaluating promotions and based on the creative work. So, so they're not penalized because they don't publish in a journal, but it is still, uh, I think the creative work have an equivalency to, to a certain uh, publication. Let's say if you do a, uh, a performance, okay, mm -hmm. uh, you organize a performance and you you, you you manage a show and so what is that equivalent to in, in a in a typical uh, uh, publication environment so how mm -hmm. do you equate that so it, it's uh, it's interesting to to do to look, look at this as well so this is something that we need to look at well I will I will look at that and uh, I could maybe add it to this final screen and then when you distribute that yes it would sure. be included how's that yep that's be good all right, any more questions? We are at 2.49, four minutes past our promised 45 minute session. Any question? As I've said, uh, today is the last session for the fall 2020. Uh, all the sessions will is recorded and will be made accessible for those of you who have missed out. Maybe a few of the session or you have forgotten some of the session and you find it important now please uh, feel free to access it. Uh, we are trying to compile it. We're putting it together so that it is centralized. So anytime you want to get access to it, it's there. So, so we have a recording, especially from, the, from early this year as we moved into lockdown. So every session is recorded and it's all available. It's all, uh, in fact, we have a Research Edge uh, YouTube channel where all the sessions, Research Edge session and uh, research workshops are all put together under the same channel. So we will give you access to it, access to every single session. Okay, so if there is no question, uh, thank you once again for the support that you have given for this whole semester. Uh, it was an interesting session for all of us. Uh, in fact, it was interesting for me and uh, Ms. Balance as well as we started preparing for all the sessions. We've learned ourselves as well, so we are also learning at the same time some, in, in some of the sessions. So it's a learning for, for all of us. Um, what is more important is you continue to participate, continue to be engaged. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to write to me or Miss Balance anytime. Um, we will be planning for the next series, the UB Research Essential uh, 3, which will begin in January. So we'll release the calendar soon. Yeah, we are just trying to finalize the actual sessions. And once it is confirmed, we will let you all know. All right then, so I do hope you have a good uh, Christmas and New Year. Have a safe Christmas and New Year. We have come to the end of 2020 and uh, let's hope for a better 2021. So um, come back safe and uh, have a good and restful uh, year end. Ms. Balance, anything you want to add? Thank you everybody for tuning in and uh, we hope 
2021 will be happy and healthy for everybody. All right, then. Thank you so much, Ms. Ellen. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, then. Bye-bye.